Welcome everyone, this is the second part of the Population Migration Unit where we'll be discussing the Malthus Theory, Ravenstein's Laws of Migration, Push and Pull Factors, and the various forms of migration. First off, let's finish off talking about population with Thomas Malthus, a philosopher who wrote an essay about population growth. Here's some of the basic principles. Food is necessary. Humans grow faster than the ability to grow food, thus checks will limit population. These checks included positive and negative checks, and they both limited population, whether it was through decreasing birth rates or increasing death rates with diseases and famine. In Malthus's mind, the population was exponential, growing at an alarming rate while food was growing arithmetically, so eventually people would die. He's sort of like the real-life version of Thanos. This universe is finite, its resources is finite. If life is left unchecked, life will cease to exist. It needs correction. You don't know that! There are many criticisms to Malthus's hypothesis, as this essay was written in 1789, so he had no idea of the various technological improvements that we would have access to. For example, now we have various technological improvements in agriculture, such as GMOs, pesticides, and tractors that allow for mass production. We also have better transportation with refrigerated trucks, and some would even argue that food production has been exponential. However, th even to this day, there are neo-Malthusians, people who believe that Malthus is still right and could be proven right in the future. The hunger and famine that still exists in the world, or even COVID could be arguments of neo-Malthusians that the world population cannot sustain and checks will limit the population. Another theory that you should be familiar with in this unit would be Ravenstein's laws of migration. There are 11 laws that you should know, and some of them make more sense than others. However, we'll point out the most important ones that apply to AP human geography. First one, there's the idea that most migrants travel short distances. That relates to the concept of distance decay, that geographic processes such as migration are less likely to occur as the cities get further and more likely if the distance is shorter. There's also the notion of step migration, that migration occurs in stages, going from small towns to a bigger city, to an industrial hub, then to a metropolitan area. This also relates to the fifth, eighth, ninth, and 10th law, as it explains that people are less likely to move from a big city to a farm, and thus large towns grow more by migration, since they have better infrastructure and services available for people. A really big concept within this unit is that people tend to move more from farms to cities and this relates to the ideas behind development and technological advancement and the demographic transition model as well. As a country develops and gets access to agricultural tools and technologies, they become more efficient at farming. If a farmer is more efficient at farming, then not as many farmers are needed and some farmers will lose their jobs and they will migrate into the city in order to find a factory job. This relates to Ravenstein's 11th law that most causes of migration are economic so that people can find jobs and survive. This concept occurred quite a bit during the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s. Take a look at this chart that demonstrates the number of people in rural areas compared to that of cities in the earlier years and compare that to modern times where developed countries will have less people as farmers. Ravenstein also implements gender within migration and states that women tend to migrate more internally while men migrate more internationally. In migration, there are two major types of causes, pull factors and push factors. They're fairly easy to remember. One attracts people to an area, the other pushes people out and they can be broken down into various categories such as cultural, demographic, economic, environmental, or political. An example of a cultural push factor is religious discrimination. Thus, a person will leave that area and perhaps be pulled into another where there's religious freedom. The Mormon migration started off as a push factor as Mormons were being persecuted in the East Coast. And this led to the migration towards Utah as they were able to practice their religion, thus being a pull factor. A push factor would be the gender imbalance in China that we talked about in part one of the population unit video. And a pull factor would be if a country was looking for a particular age group of workers. An economic push factor will usually be in the form of economic turmoil or crises, such as the 1997 Asian economic crisis, which led to people moving out of Asia, emigrating to come into the United States, which is immigration. People move into the U.S. because of the notion of the American dream and economic opportunities, thus being a pull factor. Sometimes people move to other countries without their families and they're simply there to make more money for their family. When they make money and send it back to their family or home country, this is called a remittance. And this occurs quite frequently between the United States and Mexico as demonstrated by the visual. Environmental examples of a push factor would be natural disasters. 
such as the earthquakes and disasters that recently devastated Haiti. A pull factor would be in the form of weather conditions or food availability. For example, people move to the Sun Belt because of favorable weather conditions, along with job opportunities as well. Lastly, there are political push factors, and a recent example of such factors would be the conflict in Ukraine, where it displaced around 4.3 million people because of the war. A pull factor would either be political stability or even political ideologies, where people might prefer democratic countries over an authoritative one. Speaking of the Haitian and Ukrainian situation, these events both relate to three important vocabulary terms, refugees, internally displaced persons, and asylum seekers, all of which would be a byproduct of forced migration. A refugee is a person who is leaving their country because of a push factor, which can be persecution or a natural disaster. Now, asylum seekers are similar to refugees. However, the main difference between the two comes down to recognition from the government. Take the United States government, for example. A refugee within the U.S. is somebody who is recognized and protected by the government, whereas asylum seeker is someone who has made their way to the U.S. without legally being recognized as a refugee. An internally displaced person does not cross international borders. Rather, they stay within their country and can be displaced due to violence. In Syria, there are around 6.2 million IDPs due to the civil war that is occurring within the country and the various groups fighting for control. Another form of forced migration would be slavery. And the best example of this would be the transatlantic slave trade where they forced over 10 million enslaved Africans to the Americas between the 16th and 19th century. Then there are voluntary migrations, which include transhumans, which is when people migrate for the purpose of herding and moving livestock. And this is generally seen in developing countries. There's also a transnational movement, which is movement between countries, and internal movement, which is movement within a country. As mentioned before, there's the concept of step migration, small movements from a very small town to a large town. However, then there's also chain migration, which lends itself to the ideas of demographic and cultural pull factors. Chain migration refers to the idea that people who move tend to move to areas that people from the same nationality have moved to as well. Chain migration contributes to building ethnic enclaves, such as Little Tokyo or Chinatown. And it makes sense that ethnic groups will want to congregate with one another as they will want to establish a sense of camaraderie and bring their culture with them. Then there's guest workers, which are workers from a country that migrate to temporarily work at another country to make some money and then eventually would return to their home country. During the 1940s, when Americans were off in Europe fighting the war, there was a labor shortage and the U.S. hosted a guest worker program called the Bracero Program and it hosted nearly 5 million guest workers into the U.S., mostly for agricultural labor. The final form of voluntary migration would be the rural to urban migration, which, as mentioned before, occurs as a country develops when farmers lose their jobs and move into the cities. Among the different types of migration, there's intervening opportunities, where an opportunity arises which diminishes the attractiveness of a location further away. Say that Jimmy here was planning on moving to New York from LA to search for a better paying job. Along the way, he stops by in Denver, Colorado to make a pit stop, but befriends a billionaire who wants to hire him to run his company. This would be an example of an intervening opportunity as Jimmy never made it to New York. Then there's intervening obstacles, a feature that would hinder or stop the migration. A mountain range preventing travel could be an intervening obstacle, and a language barrier could also be one as well as learning a new language is a difficult concept and might prevent people from moving. An example of a political intervening obstacle would be the government limiting your migration. Many North Koreans attempt to escape the country and either get caught by the government or the Chinese government. And when they get caught, they get repatriated, which means that they get sent back home to their country. Migration has political ramifications and there tends to be some sort of reaction from the government. Extremely high immigration numbers usually end up with limitations from the government as demonstrated by the U.S. government in its history. The U.S. has various groups of immigration come in at different times, and in the colonial times, it consisted of mostly African slaves. In the 1800s, they were northern and western Europeans called old immigrants, and one of the major reasons for migration included the Irish potato famine. In the late 1800s, Southern and Eastern Europeans were immigrating and they were referred to as the new immigrants. 
And since the 1940s to the present time, the migration mainly consists of Latin Americans and Asians. The U.S. has attempted to limit immigration several times over the course of its history with quotas and this idea of immigration being a subject of political discourse in the U.S. is nothing new to us. Take a look at this timeline of the various times that the government attempted to deal with immigration, ranging from the Emergency Quota Act of 1924 to the Chinese Exclusion Act, where a specific ethnic group was banned from immigration into the U.S. for over 50 years. Economic effects of migration include brain drain and brain gain. Brain drain would be if a country were to lose its educated population, whereas brain gain would be if educated people were to migrate into your country. This can be seen in this visual where China and India are experiencing brain drain and the U.S. is experiencing brain gain. This is also known as the diaspora of a country, which refers to the dispersion of any group of people from their homeland. Another good example of diaspora you should be familiar with is the Jewish diaspora. Migration can lead to problems with a country's dependency ratio. If the working class is moving out of the country, the government isn't able to collect as many taxes, thus bringing down their GDP. However, migration can also be beneficial to a country as they can provide labor and increase their GDPs as the migrants will start new businesses. Lastly, migration can contribute to the spread of cultures, which is occurring concurrently with the globalization of cultures. This can include food, language, religion, and much of the food that is consumed in the United States is a result of immigrants bringing their practices to the U.S., such as pho, tacos, and spaghetti. All right, that does it for the Population Migration Unit. Once again, don't forget to review the vocabulary terms with the Quizlet link down below. Happy studying.